Ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and all welcome aboard the Eastern Express. This time around, we're diving into a story that's as concerning as it is complex. Russia just received around 200 Iranian ballistic missiles. Now, to be clear, this isn't just a rumor or some online conspiracy theory. The U.S. administration itself has confirmed it, with European authorities agreeing with that assessment. But staying away from the West, what do Tehran and Moscow have to say about this? Well, you can't bet that they see it completely differently. So now let's get to it and see our latest report where we will bring you the latest on the Russian-Iranian alliance. The partnership between Russia and Iran is blossoming. During a meeting with Sergei Shoigu, Secretary of Russia's Security Council, Iranian President Masoud Pezeshkian assured of his government's commitment to strengthening cooperation with Moscow. He stated that enhancing relations would help mitigate the impact of mounting Western sanctions, which both nations face. Shoigu's visit to Tehran follows his recent meetings with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un as Russia, amid its ongoing conflict in Ukraine, seeks closer ties with countries opposing the United States. The United States has expressed concern about the growing alliances between Moscow, Tehran and Pyongyang, accusing both Iran and North Korea of supplying Russia with ballistic missiles for use in the Ukraine war. Iran denies the allegations. Shoigu's diplomatic tour comes at a critical point in the Ukraine conflict, as Kiev urges the US and its allies to approve the use of Western-supplied long-range weapons to target strategic locations, such as military airstrips, within Russia. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has warned that such support would escalate the conflict, even to the point of nuclear confrontation, drawing Western countries into a direct clash with Russia. Moscow has highlighted Iran as a key partner in several areas, and both countries appear committed to a lasting, cooperative relationship that counters Western pressures. And now let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. Unlike cruise missiles, which can be intercepted because they fly low and slow, Ballistic missiles shoot up in a vertical trajectory and come down like a hammer. They're quick, accurate, and pack a serious punch. Ukraine only has a limited number of systems capable of taking these out, and those systems are already working overtime. Nikol Goryevsky from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace weighed in on this, stating that these Iranian missiles could have a significant impact on the battlefield in Ukraine. These FA-360 missiles are lightweight and they're effective over short distances, making them perfect for hitting critical infrastructure near the front lines. Now, these might have a shorter range compared to the other ballistic missiles, but a lot more precise. Oh, and they help Russians save its long-range missile stockpile for other, more distant targets. But before we start running for the bunkers, it's important to remember that the FA-360 is no miracle weapon. It's not the game changer that Russia likely hope it is. With Moscow's forces firing more than 300 missiles a month at Ukrainian cities, the first 200 FA-360s are more like a drop in the bucket. And Ukraine's air defenses, even though they're limited, usually intercept about a quarter of the missiles coming their way. So while these new toys might make Russia's military planners feel good, they're unlikely to tip the balance of the war in a meaningful way. That said, these weapons will still cause a lot of destruction and suffering before all is said and done. But why is Iran so eager to help Russia? Well, Tehran is expecting Russia to send them the latest Su-35 fighter jets as part of this deal. Not only that, Iran's also looking to Russia to beef up its cyber capabilities and missile programs. And in return, Russia is hoping Iran will continue its military support, which already includes drones, artillery shells, and training for Russian forces on how to use these new weapons. This isn't just a trade of arms, it's an alliance built on the shared goal of destabilizing not just the Middle East, but Europe too. This cooperation might also lead to Ukraine being given the green light to strike back on Russian territory with long-range Western systems. Now, the only thing holding it back is the debate within the U.S. administration, with some actions still not fully on board. But if history has taught us anything, it's that nothing escalates quite like a good old-fashioned arms race. 
And now here to share more light on the issue is Marcin Stashinsky, lecturer at the Institute of Oriental Studies at Adam Mickiewicz University. Hello, sir, and welcome to Eastern Express. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for the invitation. So the U.S. administration has just confirmed that Russia has received around 200 Iranian ballistic missiles. Meanwhile, the Iranian president himself says that ever since he got into office, he's never given Russians any missiles. One of them are lying. We want to know who. Yes, uh, that's an important uh, topic uh, you've just mentioned, uh, uh, because uh, we have consequences of uh, these deliveries uh, regarding the Ukrainian battlefield, uh, last tragic events uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, missile strikes uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, this uh, equipment is very uh, disastrous and dangerous. For 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 uh, for Ukrainians, uh, especially civilians, uh, I think that although uh, both sides, I mean uh, uh, Russian and uh, Iranian sides, uh, uh, deny. Uh, these uh, deliveries, uh, we uh, should uh, remember that we have. Uh, and we have this uh, strong alliance between uh, Russia and Iran, especially in, in the ongoing uh, circumstances. Uh, I think that we can uh, we can mention uh, three major uh, factors regarding this alliance. Uh, it's of course political uh, and military, economic, and finally also geographic uh, factors uh, play an important uh, role in uh, this uh, alliance. Uh, I hope we have time to, to discuss a little bit more about these uh, three important factors. Sure, yeah, let's break it down a little bit. But before we get into yeah. that, what's the incentive in trying to deny this? I don't think it's fooling anybody that Iran has hostility towards U.S. in the West, as well as Russia's incentive in receiving this missile. Is it to convince other parts of the world? Is it domestic consumption, trying to convince the global south? Why are they doing this? Yes, that's also a very important question because, of course, we have uh, the Ukrainian battlefield. Uh, we have some plans of negotiations, peace negotiations. Uh, of course, Iran, we have the new uh, government and the new uh, president, uh, Pazeshkian, uh, who also tries to uh, to change a little bit the image of, of the country and start the nuclear negotiations once again. Uh, Russia as well tries also uh, domestically to show that uh, that uh, weapon sector or arms sector is enough domestically. That's why uh, the Russia transfer, uh, transformed uh, its own economy into military economy. Uh, but, uh, they, however, many, many uh, experts uh, uh, argue that uh, uh, Russia is uh, Russia relies more and more on foreign assistance, and uh, that's why Iran is an, an important player in this field. However, uh, both sides tries to deny uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this cooperation. Right. You brought up that there's uh, three or at least four different aspects yeah. of the cooperation between Russia and Iran, and one of it is being the political interest in their alliance. Uh, is it that's, are there anything else binding them together, or is there uh, just a mutual kind of disdain for the West and kind of resulting in an enemy of my enemy is my friend situation? Yes, exactly. Enemy of our enemy, of course, that's an important uh, factor you've just mentioned. But politically, we uh, should remember that uh, uh, that uh, this uh, it's a long, uh, long time uh, cooperation between Russia and Iran, especially in Syria, uh, uh, where uh, we ha we had this uh, conflict uh, uh, between opposition and, of course, uh, Al-Assad regime, uh, supported by uh, Assad regime 
supported by uh, by Iran. And uh, uh, following the sub Iranian support, we had the support of uh, Russia. Uh, just note that we have an important uh, military base in uh, Tartus in Iran in, in Syria. Uh, that's one of the rare uh, military bases, uh, Russian bases, uh, uh, in, at the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so it's an important, very important factor for Russia, especially that it's uh, embraced by uh, Western uh, Western bases, uh, military bases. Uh, so uh, Syria is also, is uh, as I said, it's an important factor. But uh, we have also just uh, the, just uh, a new new uh, important uh, topic is. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's also important because so far Russia uh, distanced itself from uh, from uh, direct involvement uh, in the conflict. But however, uh, in order to uh, distract uh, attention from uh, the battlefield in Ukraine, uh, the country or uh, or uh, the Kremlin uh, tr tries to involve more and more in in the Palestinian case, uh, supporting supporting uh, Palestine, the Palestinian case and cooperating with a uh, main uh, ally of uh, of Hamas. Uh, it means uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, including, of course, uh, Iran, Iran and Tehran. Uh, and finally, uh, we have uh, also this uh, Karabakh uh, uh, the conflict between uh, between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. That's also an important factor because it's a neighboring country of Iran, and. Uh, an involvement of Russia uh, uh, against Azerbaijan uh, is also uh, is also important because Iran also, although uh, Iran has uh, uh, 15 million of uh, the Azerbaijan uh, nationals uh, or uh, Azers, as as we call them, uh, they are they are afraid of any uh, disturbance and concerns regarding the own situation in Iran because of Azerbaijan. So that, that is why uh, Russia and, uh, and Iran uh, supports Armenia against Azerbaijan. So that's also an important factor. So political, politically, we have these, these, uh, these, uh, these topics. Uh, we should also remember that military, uh, military cooperation is also important in this, in this field, uh, because we have exchange of weapons. As, as, as we started uh, to mention about uh, uh, ballistic missiles uh, deliveries, uh, uh, just uh, a new one is, uh, is a system of, of of uh, FAT 316, uh, that's an important uh, ballistic missile, uh, already used uh, on the battlefield and very dangerous for the Ukrainian side, including Poland as well, because we have also some threats uh, against our soil in Poland. Uh, besides, we have also Iranian uh, Iranian feedback, or uh, Iran expects uh, some uh, some deliveries of weapons from uh, Russia regarding. Uh, uh, regarding uh, fighter jets uh, and, uh, for instance, S-400 uh, uh, air defense system. So that's also an important system for Iran. So this exchange, bilat bilateral exchange, is also an important factor in this uh, and this uh, uh, in this field. And finally, uh, we should remember the geographic or geostrategic uh, factor is also important because uh, these deliveries uh, in the frame of sanctions, of Western sanctions against Iran and Russia, uh, deliveries are uh, are followed or are conducted through the Caspian Sea, uh, through uh, uh, ports in uh, in Volga River, and then uh, through Volga River, uh, river deliveries are followed uh, into uh, into Russia. So that's also an important geographic or geostrategic uh, factor uh, as well. Right, so it does seem like there's a lot connecting the two countries together. And uh, my yeah. last question would be compared to the previous president. How is this, how is the new president kind of uh, interacting with Russia compared to the previous administration? Is he closer to the West or closer to Russia? 
that's also an important uh, question, and uh, and uh, it's hard to answer now because uh, it seems that uh, Pazhishkian is more moderate and more liberal, liberal than a uh, previous uh, president uh, who uh, who uh, died in the tragic event of uh, of the uh, helicopter uh, helicopter accident. Uh, but however, we should remember that uh, in Iran uh, the main player. And uh, is uh, the supreme leader of of uh, uh, of the country uh, is Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, Khamenei, uh, who plays a major role in the country. So although uh, Pazhishkian seems, especially uh, uh, in, uh, he he tries to revive uh, nuclear uh, nuclear negotiations, uh, cut. In 2000, in fact, cut in 2018 uh, by uh, Trump's uh, administ president Trump's administration. Uh, so uh, he tries to revive. But uh, anyway, uh, the supreme leader uh, of the revolution, I was calling Iran, uh, Khamenei, is the main player. So uh, I think Pazhishkian will follow his. Uh, his uh, recommendations or suggestions. That's also uh, at the level of ideological background in Iran, based on, uh, as we call, philosophic idea of uh, Wilayat al Fakih. So uh, the supreme leader is the main uh, and the most important uh, player in the country. Uh, but uh, hopefully, we also can. Uh, see some uh, may see some optimistic uh, optimistic uh, uh, scenarios that Pezeshkian will uh, reinforce some cooperation with uh, with uh, uh, foreign or Western partners, especially in the frame of uh, enrichment of uh, uranium and etc. Nuclear weapon and etc. Right. Thank you so much for your input and insight. Really appreciate it. And thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Express. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now we're moving on to the Eastern News Slash, a series of all the other stories from the East that you don't want to miss. In Belarus, the 85th anniversary of the Soviet invasion of Poland on September 17, 1939 was celebrated as National Unity Day, a holiday introduced by President Alexander Lukashenko in 2021. According to his regime, the day marks the reunification of Belarusian lands under Soviet rule. In his message to the Belarusian nation, Lukashenko says that the date marks a holiday of historical justice, a moment of national rebirth, symbolizing Belarus's unity and independence. This narrative, however, is in direct contrast to how the invasion is viewed in Poland and other European nations. For them, September 17th marks the beginning of years of Soviet occupation, repression and the partition of Poland under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The period is remembered as one of brutal oppression with mass deportations and executions. Lukashenko's holiday is seen as part of a broader effort to reshape Belarusian history in a pro-Russian direction, rehabilitating the Soviet era and downplaying Stalinist crimes. This approach increasingly aligns Belarus's historical narrative with that of Russia. <laughs> Ukraine has approved a new law allowing foreigners and stateless individuals to serve as officers in its military. A recruitment center will be established to streamline the enlistment process for foreigners who will be able to sign officer contracts for deployments ranging from one to five years. The legislation also removes previous restrictions that required foreigners to obtain Ukrainian citizenship to hold officer ranks. Foreign candidates will undergo extensive background checks, including psychophysiological testing and a polygraph exam, to verify their eligibility and detect any ties to foreign intelligence or criminal activity. Refusal to comply with these checks will result in immediate dismissal from military service. President Volodymyr Zelensky confirmed that foreign volunteers defending Ukraine, along with their families, would be eligible for Ukrainian citizenship, emphasizing that their service to the country deserves recognition and full support. During his recent Central Asian tour, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz engaged with regional leaders, exploring ways to deepen cooperation, particularly in the sphere of energy and technology. In a meeting with five Central Asian heads of state in Kazakhstan, discussions center on expanding trade with the West and reducing Europe's dependency on Russian energy. 
While no immediate deals were struck, both sides expressed optimism for future agreements. Kazakhstan's president, Kasim Jomar Tokayev, assured of the region's desire for more than just financial compensation for energy exports. Central Asian nations seek German expertise to bolster local manufacturing, green energy and high-value production sectors like finance, logistics and agriculture. Tokayev also encouraged German participation in a strategic renewable energy project involving Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan. Earlier, Scholz visited Uzbekistan and secured a deal to repatriate Afghan migrants while welcoming skilled Uzbek workers to Germany, benefiting both countries' labor markets. A joint study by the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air and the Center for Study of Democracy reveals that a loophole in Western sanctions has enabled Russia to continue profiting from oil sales. Despite the introduction of bans aimed at cutting off revenue supporting Russia's war in Ukraine, Western countries purchased two billion U.S. dollar worth of fuel refined from Russian oil in early 2024 alone. Refined primarily in Turkey, the fuel is legally imported into the West, exploiting what researchers have dubbed a refining loophole. Turkish refineries rely heavily on Russian crude, with much of their output being sold to Western nations. The report warns that Moscow's profits from this trade could finance its military efforts, undermining the sanctions' intent. Experts recommend that the EU and the G7 ban oil products refined from Russian crude to effectively counter the loophole. Level. And that's all on this episode of Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TPP World.